ان الحمد لله نحمده حمدا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله الذي يهدي عباده الصالحين ويهدي عباده المتقين ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الحمد لله الذي هدانا سبلنا وما لنا الا نتوكل على الله وقد هدانا سبلنا ولا نصبرن على ما اذيتمونا وعلى الله فليتوكل المتوكلون واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك ممن تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير انك على كل شيء قدير واشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا والاول فينا محمدا صلى الله عليه واله وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله ارسل على فتره من الرسل وقلة من العلم وجهالة في الناس من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ومن يؤب الى الله يجد الله اوابا توابا رحيما ومن يؤمن بالله يهدي قلبه ومن يتوكل على الله فهو على كل شيء قدير ومن يستنصر الله يجد الله وليا ونصيرا اما بعد brothers and sisters all of us who ask Allah to have our motion and our direction defined by Allah's straight course a course that has no zigzag has no shortcut and it has no aggression brothers and sisters Allah Azza wa Jal 
says to us to teach us, to inspire us, and to deliver us from our own selves. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Behold, you have in Allah's Messenger a model, a perfect model for those of you who wish and hope for the last day and who are consciously aware of Allah. Those who remember Allah. Numerous times, plentiful, and without end. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ for those who are wishing and hoping and anticipating Allah and the final day. And for those who are always, who always have Allah in their mind. Who always have Allah in their conscience. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Why is Allah Azza wa Jal We ask ourselves We don't ask Him Why is Allah Focusing our hearts, our conscience, and our minds on Allah's Prophet. Because we answer ourselves in trying to understand His guiding light, because we are going to be put in condition and in details of life out of which we need some guidance. But what has happened to the Muslims when they have failed to see if the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was put in those positions that he would do? The Muslim mind that is always supposed to be vibrant with the words of Allah, nourished by the ayat of Allah, and fertilized by the example of Allah, who is Allah's Prophet, alayhi salatu wassalam. What has happened to these minds when there is no longer that vibrant image in the Muslim mind that comes alive when we are in the real stuff of life. It's not too late to criticize ourselves when we fail to live up to our character. It's not too late for that. It's not too late to look around and see how Muslims de distract themselves from the major positions in life in which the Prophet was in. Because we find ourselves in those positions today. But he is not in our company because we are not mindful of Allah who presented him to us as 
a problem solver. Part of that imagery of Allah's Prophet in the thick and thin of life is he comes across problems in life. And these are not problems that have to do with private issues. These are problems that have to do with public issues. So Allah tells us, if we encounter these types of difficulties for which we find no easy solution, we refer ourselves to what would the Prophet have done if he were placed in the same position that we are in. And what positions do we talk about when Allah is drawing our attention to His Prophet? In another ayah, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ What the messenger has given you, you take. What he has restricted you from, you avoid. مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ So what happens? If we are reading these ayat and we have issues that come our way in this real life and when we are confused as to what to do why can't we arbitrate the whole issue to Allah's Prophet? If He was here knowing what we know of Him supported with the words of heaven that we still have in fact no Muslim can claim that there is one vowel or one consonant or one letter in the Quran that has been tampered with if we have all of this available to us why do we link from one problem to the next why do we suffer one catastrophe after the other why do we repeat a failure that follows another failure? Ask ourselves, why, why are we going through this? And we begin to realize that those who are making decisions for us, to them, a Rasul is an abstract. Oh, he lived at one time, he may have been, or he is, they will tell you, the example of his time and his generation and his society. What does that have to do with today? They try to make the issues of those times of the Prophet irrelevant to the issues of our times today. And if there's no connection between then and now, a Rasul becomes irrelevant. They don't put it like that. They say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad in their prayers. They repeat the ayah in the Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Certainly Allah and His angels invoke the spirit of mercy upon the Prophet. O oh, you who are committed to Allah, invoke Allah's blessing upon him. We all say this, but where is he? When we are in times that demand us to be communicating with his image, with his character, we say, we verbalize two testimonials. We verbalize that there is no deity or divinity or authority except that that is Allah. And then we verbalize the second testimonial and that Muhammad is Allah's messenger. Meaning what? He's Allah's delivery man. He came to give you the Quran and pass on. He's 
the Lord's postman. He came to give you a book and then disappear. Or should there be a sense of vibrancy that He has in our lives, that His image, His character, His model, His example, His lifetime, His seerah, are as alive here and now as they were there and then. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Those who are always occupied with Allah's zikr, with Allah's name, with Allah's reality, with Allah's presence, with Allah's power present. ما آتاكم الرسول فخذوا وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا Whatever the messenger has given you, you take. And whatever he has forbidden you, you are inhibited from. And this has nothing to do with issues purely of what is halal and haram in the narrow legalistic sense of the word. Even though it is inclusive of that. Obviously, if Allah's Prophet says, we abstain from the muharramat, the dietary muharramat, those unlawful dietary foods, we do so. But it is not limited to that. He had a character that was involved in real life. Like the real life issues around us that are never woven into this fact. What are the real life issues that we are talking about? In the past three months or so, we've heard statements that their equivalents were heard in the time of Allah's Prophet. They may not have not been by the same person, obviously. They have not, probably not been made in the same language, obviously. But those mindsets, those mentalities, those policies were all around. People say, and you heard this a few months ago, that there is a new policy in the world of infinite justice. Who is this individual who claims to be God? Infinite justice comes from God Himself. But they've elevated themselves to vocalize such words, implementing such policies that we can't choose. We, or we have to choose between two things. They tell us, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Where does all of this terminology come from? And who says you define only two positions in this world? Allah defines two positions, Al-Haq and Al-Baqir. What is right and what is wrong. And you factor in these things and then you come across to Muslims. And here we see the decision makers in Muslim countries flocking to the Fahuti side of the issue. Tell us of the Muslim officials who had the dignity and the integrity to stand up and say, no, this is not a two-sided issue. It is not as simple as being on one side and being against the net. It's not that simple. And then the words are said that this is a crusade. Was that a slip of the tongue? Imagine these things that were at the time of the same mindset was at the time of the Prophet. They intended the same thing against Muslims. How did the Prophet behave to all of this? Come say, let's meet with this person. Let's join hands. Who are these people around the Prophet? Were they not quote-unquote terrorists? If we were to slip today's language on the lives of yesteryear's characters and personalities, who, by the way, all Muslims hold in theoretical high esteem, Who's, who comes to you and is going to argue the status of the Prophet? Intimate one. 
His inner circle, his companions, his friends, everyone respects them. Oh yeah? What if you were told, you, the same person who respects them, you were told by the language of today that they were equivalent to terrorists. That's what you're being told. But are you thinking? Do you know how you are reacting to all of this? They're telling us the book of Allah is a book that generates hostilities with the Jews and the Christians. They are coming to us and telling us what our Islam is all about. And where are the scholars who are supposed to be the heirs of the Prophet? The Prophet والسلام, is reported to have said, العلماء ورثة الأنبياء The scholars are the heirs. They inherit the legacy of the Prophet. Okay. Look, look to today's scholars. If they have the mantle of the Prophet on their bodies, where are they? Speaking up to these types of issues today. One of the presidents of a European country also makes a public statement saying, that Western and Christian civilization is superior to Islamic civilization. Muslims have always been inferior to Europe and the West and Christians. These statements are made where are our defenders of the faith? Where is that senile king in Saudi Arabia? And where is his religious institutions that are spread around the world to have Muslims up to par having the image of the Prophet present in their minds when these words are being said but if they can begin to humiliate you here disgrace me here they will take this all the way back 400 years until they get to the Prophet that you and I are supposed to hold dear to ourselves. What are these ayat in the Qur'an telling us? Have you asked yourself in this context? And they begin, they're making their moves while the khatib, the preachers that are sponsored and receive their directives from the Saudi government while they are robbing you of your common sense draining you of your ability to think denying you the capability to reason that's what they've been laboring and doing in their khutbahs and in their congregational prayers and along come their superiors who implement these types of policies. Today, President Bush, what's wrong? Oh, Muslims, have you become weak? Everyone says President Bush. Clergymen say President Bush in their churches and synagogues. What's wrong with Muslims saying President Bush in the Mexican? And in the Minba? Allah pointed to individuals who stood out for their animosity to Allah and His Prophet and the committed Muslims. And you're not able to do that. Where are you? You're not located in the Qur'an and you're not located in the real world. Where have the Saudis taken you? And it's only about two more months for the Hajj. Remember the Hajj this year is going to take place when there is a worldwide war against Islamic commitment and self-determination in the world. What are you going to go do in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca and in El Medina? You're going to go with these absent minds that have been nurtured for all of these years to flock around the Kaaba as if you are animals and beasts without any thoughts in your head, without any emotions and feelings that 
flows among you as committed brothers and sisters belonging to the same prophet, belonging to the same sustainer, belonging to the same Qibla, belonging to the same holy text. You go there and you act as if none of that exists. You are almost prohibited by law. While you are in Mecca and in Al Medina from having contact with other Muslims. The Muslim body is bleeding today. And there should be preparations now for a grand Hajj. A Hajj like no other Hajj before in our time. When we are assaulted from all directions. And when our body is bleeding from head to toe. And literally we are up for eradication in the world. Unless, of course, we want to interpret our Islam in the service of the Kafirs and the Mushriks. If we do, we are exempt. We are good Muslims. You bring your Islam and you explain the policies of globalization and racism and exploitation and the rest of the injustices in the world, if you give them an explanation from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the same way the twisted minds of the Arabian Peninsula are doing around the world, then you're a good Muslim. You're a civilized Muslim. But if you say, no, Allah and His Prophet spoke on these issues, And we are against outsiders, these mushriks, these deniers of Allah, those who owe their allegiance to a shaitan. If these are the types who are going to come into my land, and into my masjid, and up to the minbar, the pulpit, and then try to whitewash the policies of today's Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, and Abu Sufyan and the rest of their life this is not this is not the message that came from Allah and this is not the message that was explained by his prophet then they're going to begin to characterize you as a radical an extremist and eventually as a terrorist and who cares they characterize the prophet with many characterizations nothing new what's new they said the Prophet was lying. They said the Prophet was under the spell of some type of sorcery. They, they said the Prophet was influenced by a religious class of people. Christians or Jews or whatever. They said all of these things. And now, they are trying to churn up the same record. They are trying to play up the same record all over again. And it should, you should feel honored if they are telling you what they told the Prophet. You should feel disgrace if they are saying negative things about the Prophet and positive things about you. And this is what's happening today. If people had enough of the Prophet's character in them, we wouldn't be where we are here and now. But this is what happened. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ A committed Muslim, man or woman, if Allah decrees a matter, have no choice. If Allah and His Prophet decree a matter, we have no choice. And Allah drew the line between us and the, these Kafirs and Mushriks. And then we have today's status quo scholars blurring this line. They blurred it so much. A Muslim and a Kafir almost become indistinguishable. If you, if you set aside the rituals, 
In everything else, they are almost indistinguishable. This was not the Prophet's behavior. It was not his sunnah. It was not his fear. And they go on the offensive. Let, let, let me give you an example of how they are on the offensive against us, even though they have no weapons in their hands. How they show their offense in other things they do. Something that is relevant, pertinent to most of us, if not all of us here. In this overall war effort against Islamic self-determination in the world, they have their journalists who come by and they want to write things about Muslims, their institutions, their masjids, their schools, their Islamic centers. Where were they before now? What inspired them all of a sudden to be so much interested in projecting their understanding of Islam? They come and they want to write articles about our schools and about our Islamic centers. And in our central and pivotal disagreement with them around al quds and Palestine, they know there are two sides to this issue. There's the Jewish, Israeli, Zionist side, and there's the Islamic, Arabic, and Palestinian side. They know that just as well as we know it. So why don't they go to the synagogue? and to the yeshivas of the Jewish community in this country. Obviously, there's a Jewish community. They're going to say, well, there's this thing about terrorism in the world. And much of it is traced to Muslim countries. Well, isn't there an Israeli type of terrorism in this world? And if they want to be apologetic for the Israeli government, in the veto, they used the veto recently, the past month, to say that international forces cannot go to the occupied lands, to the West Bank and Gaza, and act as a buffer between the terrorist Israeli government and the children of the stone. The United States saw an offense in that. What is there as an offense? The whole world community agrees. If there should be some neutral people, even though we have our difficulties with their neutrality, they're going to send in Europeans and some other troops that are under their command. But even that, even that, they will not accept. Then come and tell you, well, here in the United States, there were acts of terror that took place. And they say these acts of terror are attributed to Muslims, and the Israelis are not involved. And once again, they refuse to look at the facts with their minds. And we thank Allah that their minds do not have the courage to look at these facts. This is the beginning of their destruction. It's a mental failure. It's a moral meltdown. Who are they supposed to be and represent? Then you have... A couple of weeks ago, two American Jewish Israeli Zionist terrorists in Los Angeles. What did, they want, what did they want to do? They wanted to blow up a masjid, a congressman's office, and another place. And they were caught in their preparation for that act of terror. Okay, where are the journalists? If these two American Jewish Israeli Zionist individuals were caught, and they don't deny this, why don't these journalists go to them and ask them, what temple do you go and worship at? They must go, these are uh, quote-unquote religious Jews. They are the followers of a rabbi. 
ما هي الكهاني والجسات والاخره جتي لقوا هسه نقعد اذا يقوا شو Where do they send their children to school? Why aren't the journalists around? Why don't they do some reporting about them? But this is what happens when we are put to into a, a state of coma on Friday, are not supposed to elevate our thoughts and our morale to be courageous and bold enough To go on the mental offensive towards them, they keep on offending us. We find no solace in these messages. That's all they are. This is Islamic architecture. That's all you see there. The content, there is none. The Saudi Arabian government, the Egyptian government, or all of these rest of these governments in the area, are praying in the niche of Zionism. That's where they are performing their rukuwa and their sujood. And many Muslims follow them and they pray behind them. This is not the Islam of the Qur'an. This is not the Islam of Muhammad Rasulullah. Alayhi wa alihi salatu wassalam. No. But this is the Islam now that occupies a good 90% of our masajid, of our mosques and Islamic centers all around. People are afraid. Muslims are afraid. Afraid of who? Who are you afraid of? After all of this, there's nothing to be afraid of. Yet we find them afraid of everything. These people who elected, they say, they elected George Bush. It's a bulk Muslim vote. Go to the person you elected and say, did we elect you for, for this? To turn against us and do all of this? When you, there's not even any evidence, the facts are not around. Why are you doing this to us? But they're afraid. They've come to realize that the past ten years that they've invested in this politically and in these shenanigans of the Republican and Democratic Party have come to naught. What do you do now? And some of our dear brothers who used to be here with us in the street have gone the Saudi way. Some of them don't even have the courage to speak now. They want to modify their program to fit into the climate of the day. Not the climate of a shaitan. Is this the confidence that comes to you When you invoke a salah and a salam on Allah's Prophet, is this the independent and untarnished and self-sustaining Islam that Allah has communicated to you? Can you represent it with your behavior and your conduct? Now, if you go every week, And you pay allegiance to the sidekicks of the shaitan who occupy Al-Haramayn and the Thalith Haram in Jerusalem and the Masajid around. Faint-hearted have become the Muslims of our day. Would it be surprising if Allah took this message from you and gave it to other people who have the heart and the mind to follow through with its content. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبِدِ الْقَوْمَ غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم لو هو أنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاتم
الله الذي هدى قل إن الهدى قل إن هدى الله هو الهدى وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا المصطفى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا Brothers and sisters with allegiance and life in present and existence are due to Allah we have but Allah to thank even if our conditions are awkward and even as this president here in the White House says that the year today this statement the year 2002 is a year of war war against whom? these people who are committing mass crimes against humanity violating their own international laws in pursuit of whom? of people who only ask that their sustainer be recognized as Allah and that they have self-Islamic self-determination that has become a crime for which there's going to be a whole year of warfare and it may not end there it may go on for decades and generations at the same time that they are stealing us and robbing us they're imposing a war upon us the Muslim has become suspect go to the airport with your Muslim name and with your Muslim features and begin to feel the repercussions of what they had deep down inside of them only a few years ago they had all of these good words to be said about Muslims the Islamic community here and how it is growing and the, the post office having a stamp with Eid Mubarak on it and the inroads of Muslims having iftar in the White House and in the State Department and on Capitol Hill and all of this where's all of, the, where's all of these good feelings that were exchanged? if deep down beyond these good feelings there were the original and the genuine feelings that they had that have now surfaced and come to the fore we've seen this here on Massachusetts Avenue we don't need a declaration of a year of war to bring the message to us it's unfortunate that Muslims have to learn through the course of many years have to learn through blood and tears and sweat who their enemies are if you are a Muslim this is not a world that lacks enemies this is a world that is ready to have enemies for you you can either live up to that commitment and that responsibility or abandon altogether go and join the ranks of the Catholics and don't hide behind rituals and don't hide in the shell of a culture this war goes beyond cultures and rituals you are a target if you know what Allah and the prophets are telling you اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما